Oh, let's get our Bibles and look at uh, get Second Peter and Jude and get a finger in each of those as we uh, continue our study tonight of these two books. Uh, we are studying through Second Peter, but it's hard to study Second Peter chapter two without going over and grabbing uh, most of the book of Jude and, and trying to hold them side by side as much as you can do that with your Bible open. Now, don't tear pages out of your Bible so that you can hold them side by side. I don't recommend that. But uh, the, the terminology, the phraseology, the, uh, the expressions, even down to the very words themselves, uh, are nearly identical uh, from uh, parts of Second Peter chapter 2 and a good part of uh, the, right at the heart of the book of Jude. Uh, the reason for that is obvious that uh, Peter and Jude are both writing to uh, Christians who are dealing with similar issues. And those issues are specifically that there are false teachers uh, within the church that are threatening uh, the, uh, the health of the church, threatening the direction of the church, threatening uh, the very souls of the members of these, church, uh, of these churches that they're writing to. And I want you to remember what we looked at last week. We looked at the first three verses of 2 Peter, and that's why we've got verse 4 starting here tonight. We looked at the first four verses of the book of Jude, and we're just continuing our study here. But I want you to remember what we saw last week about these false teachers. How do they come in among the congregation? How do Peter and Jude describe their entrance into the congregation? Is it with bells and whistles? Secretly, they come in. They try to sneak in the side door. When they come in, what is it that they are bringing in? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Destructive heresies. Are there, is, is false doctrine something that, well, maybe we could, maybe we could take a little of it, but you know, we, we just can't take a lot of it. These are destructive heresies that will destroy the Lord's church. They will destroy those. What good. Well, I, I know we looked at these verses, but look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. If you've got your finger there, here's the biggest danger. The biggest danger is not the false teachers themselves. Peter and Jude are both going to deal with the false teachers and show that they are going down a path of destruction for themselves, but that's not the biggest danger. The biggest danger is the people are going to hear them. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says, Many will follow them. That's why Peter's writing. That's why Jude is writing. There's false teachers within the church, and they're writing, warning them, begging them, don't follow after these people. That's the biggest danger uh, that existed uh, within these churches that they're writing to. And so they're going to come in. They're going to come in secretly, uh, bringing these destructive heresies, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. That's the end of verse 1. Uh, chapter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3 says that they're going to use deceptive words. They're not going to come right out and tell you, but they're going to use words that, that are meant to, meant to persuade you and artfully crafted to get you to follow them. But here's what he says. Look at the end of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. What does that mean? Here's these false teachers. Are they going to get away with it? Here's these false teachers. Are they getting a free ride? No. Here's these false teachers. They are going to pay for what they're doing. Their destruction, he says, is not slumbering. Their judgment is not idle. And that's what we're getting into when we get to verse 4. Look at the first word you have in verse 4. 4. F-O-R in, in verse 4. Here, verse 4 is looking back to the previous verses. Saying, here are these false teachers coming in secretly, bringing destructive doctrines. They're trying to sneak in the side door. Many people are going to follow them. You need to be aware of this, but understand their judgment is coming. The consequences for what they're doing is going to come upon them. And here's, here's how God chooses to prove that. God has made a statement in verse 3. Destruction and judgment is going to come upon these false teachers. Well, God, how do we know that? How can we be certain that you're going to take care of these people? Four, here we go. Three, three things in, in the book of 2 Peter, three things in the book of Jude, and, and one of them is different. Four, if God did not spare the angels who sinned. Did you know angels could sin? They can. 
God did not spare the angels who sinned. Are angels perfect? Apparently not. Uh, are angels, uh, um, uh, angels have been created by God, is that true? Creatures that have been created by God for a specific purpose and use uh, on God's behalf, do they have the ability to make choices? These sinned. They had the ability to make choice. When the Bible teaches about Jesus coming and dying on the cross, did Jesus die for the angels and for their sins? No, He didn't. He died for us. He died for you and me. Here are these angels who sinned. Notice what happens. Look over in Jude, verse 6, and we're going to come back to verse 5 in just a minute. Here were these angels who did not, what, how did they sin? They did not keep their proper domain. What does that mean? Well, we don't know a whole lot about exactly what that's talking about, but here, they had... Angels had a particular place in which they were to abide and dwell. And here were angels who were not satisfied with that. And so they did, not, they did not stay, they did not maintain, they did not keep themselves within their proper domain. And here are angels who are not recipients of the redemptive plan of God. God sent His Son to redeem mankind who sinned following Adam and Eve when they ate of that fruit. Here were these angels who sinned. They did not keep their proper domain. So what happened? Peter says they were cast, they, that God cast them down. Remember what he's trying to do. Prove to these readers that false teachers are going to pay, that judgment upon the wicked is inevitable. Here's angels who sinned. What happened to them? God cast them down to hell delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. This word hell here is interesting. And in, uh, in the Bible, there are, there are three words that are used, uh, that are translated hell. Three Greek words that are translated hell. One of them is unfortunate that it's translated this way. Um, it's translated hell in the King James, but if you come to the New King James or New American Standard, some of the newer translations, the Greek word uh, Hades or Hades, is translated in the King James, hell. Well, when we think hell, we think eternal dwelling place of those who are condemned for all of time in a place of fire and place where the devil and his angels are going to be condemned. But that's not what the Hadean realm is. It's not hell. And so as some of the other translations would translate it, they translate it Hades, but sometimes it was translated hell, which gets a mixed, mixed uh, communication. Second word. It's not the word here. Uh, but it's the Greek word Gehenna. And that's the word that is used by Jesus and by New Testament writers to talk about the place where the devil, his angels, and the, and the condemned, the unrighteous, and the ungodly will be condemned for all time. That's the eternal place, uh, the lake of fire. Gehenna. Came from the name of the place outside the city of Jerusalem where they threw all of their trash and the place uh, was literally um, hell. That's Gehenna. The Greek word here is Tartarus. And uh, there's some discussion about whether this is talking about hell, the eternal, uh, the eternal hell, or if this is talking about uh, the, uh, some other place. Put it in its context for a minute. It's not the word Gehenna, it's the word Tartarus. God cast them down to hell. These angels who sinned. He delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Jude says, He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for judgment of the great day. Is this hell talking about the eternal hell or is this hell perhaps talking about the place where the rich man went in Luke chapter 16? Remember where he went? Where the Bible says this rich man died and he was... Uh, and, and he went to a place where he said he was in torments. And he called upon Abraham and said, Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He was in torments. He was being tormented. Was that hell? 
Was that the eternal abode of the devil, his angels, and the unrighteous of all time? Was, that, was he in eternal hell? No. He was in that portion of the Hadean realm where the, where the spirits, the departed spirits of those who leave this earth go, th those who are righteous, like the beggar in Luke chapter 16, went to Abraham's bosom. But this rich man went to a place that's called Torments, and perhaps that place is called Tartarus, where these angels were sent. And there they are being reserved for judgment. Here's what's interesting. They are being reserved, where does it say, uh, under darkness? Uh, I guess it's under punishment is later down in here. That their punishment was not only going to take place after the judgment, the angels' punishment was already taking place. They were already, in a sense, in hell, whether that was the eternal abode or not. What is God's point in all of this? God's point in this is, you think these false teachers are going to get away with what they're doing? If the angels didn't get away with it, you can know that these false teachers who are, are bringing havoc upon the church are going to pay the ultimate price. In Jude's account, he mentions uh, something that Peter does not. And in Peter's account, he mentions something that Jude does not. Uh, each of them give three illustrations, but this is the one that's different. In Jude... Jude says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. God's people were in the land of Egypt. He sent Moses into Pharaoh. Moses going into Pharaoh ultimately secured the release, the exodus of God's people. They come out. They're saved by God. They cross through the Red Sea on dry ground. They're saved by God. Then what did they start doing? Uh, started complaining. Started worshiping idols. Started uh, involving themselves in immorality. Started sinning. What happened to them? Did they continue to be saved? Afterward, these people, these people that God saved, God destroyed these same people. Jude says, in one simple phrase, because they did not believe. How do we know they did not believe? Because it was represented in their actions. If you make, if you make notes in the margin of your Bible, you might write down next to Jude verse 5, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 1, uh, 1 through 10, 1 through 11, where it, you have Paul talking about the same exact thing, that God brought his people out and yet they turned against him. And those people who were saved were then destroyed by God, his own people. Peter points out another illustration. He says, here's his second illustration, God did not spare, he did not spare the angels. Second illustration, he did not spare the ancient world, but he saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So here's another illustration of God's people who, uh, six chapters after their creation, but as we know it, 1,656 years after creation, these people turned against God. And Genesis chapter 6 says, every intent of their heart was only evil continually, except for one man and his family. In this verse, he calls him a preacher of righteousness. Uh, Noah was not only a preacher of righteousness in what he would proclaim, but he was a preacher in righteousness in, in the way that he lived. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because of the way he lived. But here was another example of God destroying the people. If these people did not escape, if the angels did not escape, if, the, uh, if God's own people, the Israelites, did not escape his judgment, are these false teachers going to escape? Here's a, here's a third illustration uh, that both Peter and Jude mention. And that is the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. When you think of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, do you have pleasant thoughts? Do you have uh, good thoughts? Do you have, well, maybe, that's, uh, maybe those are positive examples for us to follow. We, we don't, when we hear Sodom and Gomorrah, we don't think anything good. We know if you're going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, there's trouble. When, Pete, when Jesus mentioned in his life, when uh, Peter mentioned, Jude mentioned it here, you know you're talking about a major example. Here's Sodom and Gomorrah. 
and not just Sodom and Gomorrah, but as Jude mentions, uh, those cities that were around them. If you go back and read uh, the book of Genesis, uh, you go back and read the book of uh, Deuteronomy, uh, you have at least two other cities uh, that were there that were destroyed uh, with them, Admah uh, and uh, Zeboim were two other cities that were destroyed. But here's Sodom and Gomorrah. What did they do? Jude says in Sodom and Gomorrah that they had given themselves over. Somebody got a different translation. This is New King James on the screen. This says that they had given themselves over to sexual immorality. What does that mean? Here was a lifestyle. A lifestyle of sexual immorality. And what did they do? They sold themselves to it. They gave their lives entirely to it. Jerry, what does New American Standard say? I can't remember. Indulge. Indulge. Does it have sexual immorality? Indulged in gross immorality. Sodom and Gomorrah. What was it that they were indulging in? This was not just... This was not just something that characterized a few of the people in the city. Remember when Abraham wanted God to spare Sodom and Gomorrah? How many people did he get down to in his plea to God? If I can find this many righteous people, will you spare it? How many people did he get down to? Ten. Could he find ten righteous people in these two cities? No. This was not something that a few people were, were, were involved in. It wasn't something they were just playing with on the side. This was something they had given themselves over to, that they were indulging in. This was, this was all that they were about. They had given themselves over to sexual immorality, and Jude says they had gone after strange flesh. What's that? Perversion. What is that? What's wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah? It's interesting in that class we had uh, sometime last year where we reviewed uh, what Newsweek was trying to promote that uh, the Bible, Newsweek had an an issue last year that tried to say that the Bible promotes and God accepts and He approves of the homosexual lifestyle. And they were trying to use the Bible to prove it. You come to the English language. Do we have any words in the English language, just in our English language, that would say Sodom is not good? Sodomy. We have a word that's based upon cities that were destroyed by God thousands of years ago. What did they go after? They indulged in, not just, they indulged in gross immorality, going after strange flesh. Here were individuals who were, in, in, in this word strange is the Greek word heteros, they were going after those men, going after men, as Paul would say in Romans, doing that which is unnatural and taking that upon themselves the consequences of those actions. We know Sodom and Gomorrah, and at least these two other cities, were full of immorality, were full of homosexuality. And Abraham could not even find ten righteous souls there. That's pretty scary. Peter doesn't use this same terminology, but notice three expressions he uses to describe them. They lived ungodly. They were ones uh, talking about Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. And and the expression filthy conduct there is, is specifically and expressly talking about the sexual conduct. It's not just talking about they were doing, you know, bad or naughty things. It's talking about the fact that they were given over to sexual perversions. That's what the filthy conduct means. They were engaging in lawless deeds. And God did not spare these cities. In fact, God made an example of them. Both Peter and Jude tell us that God was making them an example. What should we learn? What should Newsweek learn? What should America learn? What should Christians learn as an example? God said He made them an example, and that word means that it's still today. Didn't you, it's not past tense. He made them an example for people back then. That's, that's continual. They are still an example. He has set them forth. 
That's an interesting word. The word set forth there, the Greek word means it's like lying a dead body out. Like a corpse, lying a dead corpse out, ready to be picked up. And I found that interesting in this whole thing we're hearing about Haiti and all these corpses laying out. And there's nothing those corpses can do but just lay there. God set forth Sodom and Gomorrah just like that. Set them out there. Set them forth as an example for us to look at and to say what? Is God okay with homosexuality? Not any part of it. There are two cities, yea, four, that the Bible says, and I believe it's in Peter, that God turned them into ashes. Was that just the buildings and, and, the, and the roads? And was that just like the, the stuff that was in the houses? No, that's the people and all the stuff that was in the cities. What's Peter and Jude's point? These false teachers are not going to escape because here's Sodom and Gomorrah. They have been condemned to destruction. They are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God has set them forth. But here's what I want us to see before we leave these verses. The contrast that Peter draws between Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot. Did God make a distinction between the people in Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot? Or did he just throw Lot in the mix with the rest of them? No, there was quite a distinction. And so here was righteous Lot, as he's described by Peter. Here's righteous Lot. He was oppressed. This is passive. He was being oppressed. He was being distressed. He was being worn out by the filthy conduct of the wicked. If you had lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, would you have been oppressed, distressed, and worn out? By the filthy conduct, that's passive. That means what they are doing is having an effect on you. Would, would that have been true of you? Do you sometimes feel like you're living in Sodom and Gomorrah now? Sometimes. Is what's happening in America distressing you, oppressing you, wearing you out with all the immorality? It was for Lot, and he was a righteous man. But look at what he says in verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul. How many times is he called righteous? Righteous lot, righteous man, his righteous soul. He tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Every day he saw their lawless deeds. Every day he heard their lawless deeds. Verse 7 says that he was being oppressed. That's passive tense, meaning all of that was happening and it was making him oppressed. It was happening to him. That's passive. But verse 8 is not passive, it's active. Who was it? The old King James says it vexed. New King James says Lot tormented his righteous soul. Who was tormenting Lot's soul in verse 8? Who was, who was tor torturing is another word for it. Who was tormenting his soul? This is fun. In verse 7... It's the unrighteous who are tormenting him and oppressing him. In verse 7, it's the ungodly acts that are causing him great stress in his life. In verse 8, it's Lot who's tormenting himself. Huh? Why would he do that? I mean, that's what it says, isn't it? This righteous man tormented his righteous soul from day to day. Why did he do that? Here's Lot. Here's Lot living in Sodom and Gomorrah, a place that had given themselves over to gross immorality and gone after strange flesh. He's living in this city, but did Lot allow himself to become corrupted by it? No. Did Lot allow himself uh, to become indifferent to it and say, oh, well, it doesn't really matter? No. Did Lot allow this to affect him or did he stay concerned about it? He tormented his righteous soul every day. Why would you do that? How are you going to change this world? How are you going to change those people who believe that homosexuality is acceptable to God? 
How are you going to change these people who, who want to bring uh, all of this immorality into our schools and teach homosexuality to our children and to give them condoms so that they can go and have sex when we know they don't need to be having sex? How are you going to deal with all that's happening in our nation when we continue to abort oh, you know, all of these babies? Every day we're aborting these unborn children. What are you going to do in this nation where all that our nation seems to want to do is to, is to give itself over to immorality? In a passive sense, folks, that needs to be oppressing us, distressing us, and driving us nuts. But if we're just going to sit back, if we're going to say, well, I just can't do anything, then we're not like righteous Lot. Righteous Lot every day was of the mindset of this is not right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to passively stand by and just let these things happen. Notice, what, oh, I wish we had time to go back to Genesis Go back and read Genesis 18 and 19. Was there anybody in Lot's family that was involved in this lifestyle? His own family was. He's not talking about people on the outside. Well, you know, they're bad and they're bad and they're doing... It's his own family. Was he willing to defend his own family and say, oh, it's okay? Was he willing to say, oh, well, that's my family, so homosexuality is not so bad because that's, that's my own son-in-law? Was he willing to do that? Would it torment your soul? Would you torture your own righteous soul every day if your own children were involved in that kind of lifestyle? I know some of you who may not have that exact situation, but you've looked at your own children and their lifestyles and you torment your righteous soul every day wondering, what can I do to change them? What can I do to help them? Every day you think about your children. What can I do to turn them back? That's where Lot was. And yet, here he's described as a righteous man. Remember Noah, one of eight souls who was saved? Remember Lot, less than ten righteous people. Folks, are we going to be a Noah? Are we going to be a Lot? They, don't elect, they, they, they did not yield. They did not become indifferent. They did not become tolerant. They stood up for righteousness even when it was not popular. Richard? Okay. Yes. And we don't think that's all that bad a thing. I mean, it's, it's things like those blasphemous words, not hollow words. But he was making a connection between that false teaching, which we kind of look at as, okay, well, if that person just happens to be uh, in the world of culture today, progressive. I, I think I'm following you. A couple things Richard's saying is one, you, you look at Sodom and Gomorrah and where, where they ended up, well, is that where they started? You know, and, and, and let, let, me, let me come back and say this while I'm thinking about it. The, the, the false teaching that was involved here uh, that these men are writing to and writing about was not, was not limited to someone coming in and saying, uh, here, here's, something, here's something about baptism, here's something about the church, here's something about worship that was false teaching. Their, their false teaching had very much to do with, with this matter of, of immorality, that they were trying to loosen up God's, uh, uh, 
uh, God's uh, conditions on morality. They were trying to loosen up and get people to be more free in, in their activities uh, with, with, the, with uh, relationships and that kind of thing. So it may not have been so much doctrinal as it was in, in some of these other areas. But as Richard's saying, it, you know, you get, you, get to, uh, uh, you get to Sodom and Gomorrah, and where did it start? You get to uh, God destroying the earth with a flood, and where did it start? Well, it started the same way that these false teachers. It just started with a little bit coming in at a time. And it's just started quietly and secretly until, you know, if you could see the end result, would you have done something about it? If you knew that's where it was going, you know, red flags, whoa, hold the phone, let's let's hang on a second. But when it starts coming slowly, I know we don't know much about snowballs, (laughs) <laughs> down here, but we talk about the snowball effect to where a snowball just gets larger and larger to the point that you can't do anything to control or stop the snowball. It just gets too big and it gets going too fast. Why were Peter and Jude, and I know I didn't, I, I didn't grasp, and, and I like your comments there, Richard, I didn't grasp all of them, uh, but why are Peter and Jude they're writing about the flood. They're writing about Sodom and Gomorrah. Are, are there two occasions? They're writing about angels who sinned. These are not little examples of people who were condemned by God. These are huge examples. You have the whole nation of Israel. Peter and Jude are trying to get their readers to understand how serious it is to recognize false teachers, to mark false teachers, to abstain from false teachers, and to do away with the destructive heresies that these false teachers bring in. We have to be ever vigilant in in our study of the Word of God to know what the Bible... As we said last week, I'm coming, Dirk. As we we said last week, we cannot know, we we cannot possibly know every false doctrine that exists in the world. But if I know the doctrine of Christ, if I know the doctrine of Christ, then I can hold that next to every other man-made doctrine in the world and recognize what's true and what's not true. Dirk? Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely parallels when, you, as Dirk says, you've got Israel who's seen the power of God, saw the plague, saw the, 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 Red, uh, the Red Sea parted, saw all these miracles, and then what do they do? Right there in the face of God at the, mountain, at the foot of the mountain, begin worshiping idols. When you, when you, when you see these angels who, who understood, witnessed the majesty of God, and yet, you know, with freedom of choice and freedom of will, can... Uh, It's, it's a matter of who we set out to please. It's a matter of whose eyes we try to see this world through. We, if we see this world through our own eyes and not through God's eyes, if we see truth and what we believe to be truth, and if truth is subjective, then it's through our eyes and it's not through God's eyes. It's not objective. It's not the truth. It's whatever we want to make truth out to be. And so if anybody has that mindset, whether it be an angel, a Jew, a Gentile, this, this other example, then then, yeah, it's, it's a mindset that anyone can have. Judy?
Yes, Judy, absolutely. You know, it's, when it, how, do, how, do you, how do you keep false doctrine from overtaking the Lord's church? How do you keep it from conquering and taking the Lord's church um, uh, completely? You have to take care of it when it's manageable. You have to be vigilant. You have to be watchful. You have to take care of those matters that would, that even the smallest of matters. Lot was not tolerant. He was not indifferent. He, he, he didn't just sit there and say, oh, well, you know, nobody's going to listen to me. He tortured his righteous soul every day. What can I do? What can I do? Folks, we don't need to be indifferent to doctrine. We don't need to be of the mindset that says, well, you know, we need to be more concerned about love and about grace and about accepting everyone and less concerned about doctrine and about truth and about what we really teach or what we don't teach. I say you can't, you can't have one without the other. You can't be so focused on doctrine that you leave out love, but you can't be so focused on the love of God that you leave out doctrine. How, how can you have one without the other? Jesus said, if you love me, there it is. What? Keep my commandments. Jesus puts the two of them together. Let, 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 me, let me get on to these, to these last few verses in this section so that we can see how, how Peter and Jude both, and, and this is one of my favorite verses here in, in 2 Peter chapter 2. We, you can get real depressed in those first eight verses of 2 Peter chapter 2. You know, because God is laying it down. He's saying, here's these false teachers. They're going to be punished. They're going to be destroyed. But Peter is one to quickly point out God makes a distinction between righteous lot and everybody else who is in Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 9, he says, the first word is then. If you go back up to verse 4, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, the first word is if. Here's an if-then statement. If God did not spare the angels, if God did not uh, spare those in the days of Noah, if God did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, if, 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 then, here's his, here's his conclusion. If God did not spare them, and then he says, but if God delivered righteous lot, then God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Folks, that ought to be one of the most comforting statements in all of the Bible. No matter what we are dealing with, God knows. He knows what we're dealing with, and he knows what? How to get us out of it. This word temptations is the same word as the word trials back in 1 Peter. Remember what we said about these two books, that, uh, uh, that 1 Peter is about trials from the outside, outside world, and, and 2 Peter is about trials from inside the church and these false doctrines. And the same words used in both books, but here Peter says God knows how to take care of you no matter what the danger is, where the danger is coming from. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and... He knows how to reserve the unjust for punishment. He knows how to keep them under punishment. We're not going to be able to finish. I really wanted to finish this section. If, if you're looking at the parallels and, and the symmetry between these, uh, between these passages, uh, here they are for you real quick. Uh, Cam, give me about a minute, please. God, several times, uses this word reserve. You see it here in verse 9, you see it back in verse 4, and I've neglected, I think it's also in verse 17 of 2 Peter chapter 2. uses the, reserve, the word reserve several times in the book of Jude, talking about these ungodly. Remember in 1 Peter, he said, the godly have a reservation in heaven, a place reserved for you by the power of God. Here he's saying, God has a place reserved for the ungodly. It's reserved. It's waiting for them. Why is he saying that? Because he's trying, remember, here's false teachers. Are they going to get away with it? No. They have a reservation. They have been have a, a place reserved for them under punishment. And he says, especially for those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. That's these false teachers. Remember, it's not just doctrinal things that they're, fault, that they're teaching about. It is about this uncleanness. It's about this immorality uh, that, that, uh, that they are defiling their own flesh. These people are so sick that they not only want to live according to the flesh, they want what comes from that. They want to defile the flesh. That's what their desire is. Their desire is to, is to reap the benefits of sowing to the flesh. Is that sick? These people are warped. They despise, they reject authority. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. They don't care who it is. 
Whether it's God who's the authority, whether it's man who's the authority, they don't care. They'll blaspheme whoever it is. Why? Because they're presumptuous, Peter says. They're presumptuous. They're self-pleasing. They're only concerned about themselves. Say again. That sounds, like <laughs> sounds like America. Uh, and so his last point is, guess what? Here's these people who speak evil of authorities. They speak evil even of the authority of God. And his last point is, you know what? Even angels don't do that. And he, he mentions, a, Jude mentions an occasion. We don't have information about it other than right here. Where Michael, the archangel, confronted uh, the devil after the death of Moses. And we don't know all that was involved in disputing about uh, the body of Moses. But Jude says, here's Michael. He dared not bring an accusation against the devil. If Michael, he says, is not even willing to, uh, to uh, speak evil against, to blaspheme, to revile against uh, the devil, who are these false teachers? Who are these false teachers who can speak evil of dignity? Who are these false teachers who, who, who are acting like they're acting? If even the angels wouldn't do that. These false teachers think they're so great. Here's angels. They wouldn't do that. It's an interesting discussion. And we'll, we'll pick up the next verses next time. It's an interesting discussion. But some of the strongest language in all of the Bible is found right here. Where God is talking about false teachers. They are going to be punished. They're going to be punished severely. But he says to these Christians, but remember... God knows how to take care of you. Richard, real quick. That's all we know about the Michael part, but we'll, st we'll, we'll review this and start, we'll start with the Michael part. We'll start with the Michael part next week.